the batteries wired together, it's time to now wire the solar controller into it. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to cut these wires. We're going to mount the solar controller here with one of the panels that came with this vehicle from the factory. We'll just cut it out with the oscillating tool we talked about. And then we'll hook the batteries up. We, we won't hook these up to the uh, controller first. The batteries get hooked up to the controller first. That's the next step. Talk about it. I've got plenty of wire here, so I'm going to make a service loop. This is called a service loop. And we're just what we're doing is we're making extra in, in the case that there needs to be service work done in the future. I can't imagine what that service work might be, but maybe she switches over to a more panels and a stronger controller and she just wants extra wire. We don't want to cut the wire too short in this case. So I'm going to give her a service loop. With this uh, pure sign wave inverter, there's a couple of settings that we need to take note of to make sure that we've got it set for the situation that we have it in. Refer to the manual, make sure your settings are solid. It's not a good idea to go off of my settings, but I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna do, or Sarah and I are gonna do. Looking at the manual, we have a AGM-1, which is switch setting these are AGM batteries absorbed glass mat and so we want to set the setting on the inverter to reflect that which is what setting number what there's our dial number two so we just need to move that over to number two easy as that now the inverter knows what kind of batteries we have now for the dip switches let's take a look at what we do next for those here's the dip switches right here what's going on here is we've got the battery bank wired together we're incorporating the inverter into it but before we go in straight to the inverter we need to put a 200 amp breaker in between the inverter and the battery bank two I'm saying 200 amps because it's 200 it's 2,000 watts so we're putting a 200 amp uh, circuit breaker in Okay, you're all done with that last wall plate. So we have one here, 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 and one right here. These are 50, 15 amp. We are on auto. The inverter's on. Our service charge is 13.7. The reason that we're only pulling in one and a half amps is we intentionally parked in the shade so we could work in the shade. Let's test it. So grab, grab this and plug this in to this one if you would. And let's charge our speaker. So we're charging. Let's keep going. 
we'll try that back outlet and see what you get. Charging your phone. Good deal. Let's try a power tool. Try that heat gun. That heat gun is 1500 watts. So it's going to pull somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 amps. Maybe 12 watts per amp. The biggest thing you can do to use power is to not back here. heat with electricity. Turn it off. I can feel it up here too. Good job. Our inverter should turn off. The fan's just cooling the inverter. Now it's off. So we're good to go. Thirteen. The next step for CC's build is we're going to install an isolator, also known as a continuous duty solenoid. This one's going to be 100 amps. I'll put a link in the notes to the exact one that we're using. We're going to run heavy gauge wire and ground it and put a breaker in the system too. And the reason that we put this in is so when she starts her engine and drives her vehicle, she can glean power off of the alternator to also charge her coach batteries in the back. It's a great addition to any install. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that I look at is where we're going to install it, how we're going to ground it, and how we're going to pick up power. And right here, I've got positive post that I can come off of for power. We need to put the solenoid in a place where it's grounded, yet out of the way. We'll come up with some ideas for that. And then we're going to figure out how we're going to run the cable from the engine compartment back to where it goes in the uh, in the coach battery area. The way this isolator is set up, it has three contact points. Let's take a look. You've got two here, which are going to be both positive cables, and one on the top. There should be a fourth. In the case of the way this one was engineered, the fourth are the mounting spots here. When we, we need to scrape the paint off on both sides of this and mount it with some self-tapping screws. Check underneath to make sure we don't penetrate a, uh, a radiator. I've already checked the clearance on the, on the hood, so this is a good location. We're gonna mount it here. The positive cables go here one from the battery and one to the coach batteries and this is where we run a wire from a continuous ignition source inside of the fuse panel using a fuse tap and i'll show you all that i just sanded these spots and then used some self-tapping screws now i'm going to find out where i'm going to put this uh, breaker in a place that makes the most sense Sarah and I just pulled the cable through. What I did is I doubled up two 
10 augs because the other option was something too thick. As long as we got the ice cream truck in the shot, that's all that matters to me. We're gonna use in this installation a 100 amp breaker. The solenoid is rated for 100 amps and that's what we're gonna use for the breaker. And we're gonna mount it in the engine compartment because if the breaker should need to go off because of overpowering the line, I would rather it happen as short a distance from the battery as possible rather than putting it in the coach batteries where it's gonna, the power is gonna go all the way through the system and then hit the breaker. Let's catch it real early in the problem. And so that's why I recommend putting the breaker in the engine compartment. So let's go ahead and do that now. I'm just going to double check my clearance on the hood, make sure we're good to go there. Everything looks good here. The last step outside in this compartment is to connect the continuous ignition source to the top here. And then we're going to connect it to a fuse in the fuse panel using a fuse tap and I'll show you what that is if you've never seen one before. It makes this job a whole lot simpler and holds up to potential problems a lot better when we use fuse taps, I'll show you. And you can see right here the fuse panel that we're going to access to get that ignition source for the solenoid. The way that we figure out how to wire the inside to make the solenoid work right and to make this whole thing operate the way it's supposed to is I take my voltmeter and I put it on the black contact I put on the frame of the vehicle so I can put it right here on this bolt and then I come down and I touch one of these fuses and when I touch the fuse what I want it to do is absolutely nothing you can the way these fuses are made is they've got bare spots on the top of them to touch with the contacts to make contact and see if you've got a continuous ignition source, but also you can use these contact points to see if the fuse is bad. So instead of pulling fuses out and visibly looking at each one of them, you can put your meter in such a way as that it makes noise and then put both contact points on the fuse. And if it doesn't make noise, then the fuse is blown. Just a quick lesson on how fuses work, but we've touched our black on the frame. We touched our red on the fuses and I just went down every one of them like I'm gonna go on this one right now and you're gonna see the meter jump up to 14.2 volts then the keys out so we know that this is not a continuous ignition source I go through each fuse until it still reads zero when I touch it and then I asked Sarah to turn the key and when she turned the key the voltage jumped up well that told me that that fuse is is running a component that only needs to be on when the engine is running otherwise there doesn't need to be any power to that fuse such as a blinker if you've got a legend on the back of your plate and it says blinker that's a safe bet that you can use that but if you don't this is the the other way to do it so without a doubt you're getting the right fuse for what you want to do now that I know what I have it's 15 it's a 15 amp fuse and I don't want to mess with that because I figure the engineers wanted it to be 15 for a reason so I'm gonna put that in the fuse tap to replace the socket that we're going to use with our fuse tap. And then I'm putting a fuse in to replace it. Now this is a green 30 amp fuse. I could probably go for a little bit less than that. Obviously this wire isn't going to handle 30 amp fuse, but that's what I'm going to use. 
or this wire is for a uh, lighter gauge than that but I'm gonna use a 30 amp fuse for the for the uh, solenoid and this is you can buy these on Amazon I'll put a link in the notes it's already comes with a butt splice so I'm gonna come in with my wire that I ran strip it butt splice it and then push it into that socket that Sarah and I tested and we know is the right one and then I'm going to show you how to test this whole thing. There's a couple of ways we can test it to make sure we did it right. We want to make sure we did it right before we put all our tools away and crack a beer. Let's cut that back a little bit. And I'll show you how to do that so you know that it's right. Klein crimpers. These are the crimpers that the professionals use. Thank you, Larry Berry and uh, Terry. Now I'm gonna just push this in where it goes. These blades are pretty weak, so I wanna make sure that I do a good job. Now, there's two ways that we can test this. Way number one. Come on, Sarah, let's go outside and we're going to show them way number one. Way number one is we're going to send power to this solenoid. When we send power to it, it's got a little mechanical piece that flips inside of it. And we're going to be able to hear it flip and we can put our hand on it and feel it knock when it flips. It won't hurt you, so you don't have to worry about that. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the key and, and have Sarah tell me if she hears it or feels it. Yeah. That's the first way. Now let's say that you're out here doing this by yourself and you don't have a Sarah there's another way you can do it I'm gonna show you right now let's go hook our meter up to our batteries you're gonna have to have a meter I can't do anything about that get yourself some alligator clips and have them with you all the time they're not that expensive and there's a bunch of uses for them I'm gonna clip on my positive And I'm going to clip on my negative over here. And I'm going to get a reading. In this case, my reading is 13 and a half volts. I don't care what this reading is. I just want to note what it is. And in this case, it's 13.5. Now we're going to go start the engine and send power back from the alternator to charge these coach batteries. And when I do that, that number is going to change and go up if everything is correct and that's the second way we can test it so I'm gonna go start the engine now 13.5 now the alternator run and we should be sending juice back here what's it say 13.5 We're connected. We're everything is right. Man, that should be climbing. That's just all there is to it. You know why we heard the solenoid, but it didn't change? Come on outside and I'll show you. Solenoid's working. Solenoid's working. Alternator's working. Why the heck didn't that number change? Because our breaker is tripped. So I'm going to set the breaker. Now let's check it. 13.5. Oh, this thing got tired of waiting around for me. Now we're at 13.8. 
13.8.4. So we're getting a trickle charge from the alternator to charge our coach batteries. So now we know it's working. Now just, just for fun, we're already there, but just for fun, let me go turn the key off and let's watch that 13.8.7 drop. Now it's at 13.8.7. I bet it's at 13.8.8 by the time I get back. Yeah, but it's now. What are you at now? 13.9. And how there about it now? goes, dropping down. Now what do you have? 13.71. So it's got a little bit of a charge that it's maintaining from the alternator. There you have it. We've now installed a, a isolator solenoid. Some call it a continuous duty isolator isolator solenoid. Some just call it a isolator or a solenoid. I'll put a link in the notes. It's in the kit that I have for what we're installing here, but I'll put a link in the notes to that specifically. Now she can charge her batteries both from the sun when she starts a car and also a third wave from her shore power, which she can use a Honda or a Yamaha, any generator to plug it into, or if she goes to an RV park or a friend's house, she can plug shore power straight from there stuff but now she's got three ways to charge these batteries next we'll be installing the max fan and then i think that'll just about wrap it up for sarah and i down here in southern california for cc's build thanks for watching Oh. Awesome.